Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Dr. Paul Cadets, and I'm the chair of the Center for Executive Education at the University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda. And I welcome you to this very special webinar marking the WHO's World Patient Safety Day concerning health worker safety in a time of pandemics. We are especially lucky to have an outstanding panel of experts to present this discussion and encourage you to contribute any questions you may have in the Q&A selection on the bottom of your screen. I'd like to start by introducing our host and moderator, Professor Agnes Benoaho, MD, MP, PhD. She is the Vice Chancellor of the University of Global Health Equity she previously worked as the Executive Secretary of Rwanda's National AIDS Control Commission as Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Health, and uh, she served as the Minister of Health in Rwanda. She serves as a Senior Advisor to the Director General of the WHO, a Senior Lecturer at Harvard Medical School, and she serves as an Adjunct Clinical Professor at Dartmouth University. Dr. Binawaho is the, a member of the U.S. National Academy of Medicine and a fellow of the African Academy of Sciences. She has published over 190 peer-reviewed articles and was named among the 100 most influential African women for 2020. Won't you please join me in welcoming Vice Chancellor Binawaho. Uh, thank you, Paul, for your wonderful introduction and thank you to our panelists for joining us today. I also want to thank the participants, participants to join us from around the world. Today we mark the, uh, the occasion of the World Patient Safety Day, uh, this webinar, uh, and we are looking uh, to the significance of health worker safety at the time of COVID-19 pandemic. I want first to recognize that this webinar has been hosted by the Center of Executive Education at the University of Global Health Equity, which is developing a full executive uh, education program in patient safety and health care quality. The pandemic has affected about millions of people globally, killing almost one million people in less than one month, uh, nine months, sorry. And uh, uh, COVID has unveiled challenges and risks health workers are facing globally, including infection, violence, stigma, psychosocial and emotional trauma, and even death. Health workers' safety is linked to patient safety, and patient outcome is also very uh, different according very different conditions, socioeconomic, but also race. And this will be uh, discuss today. I'm excited today to be joined by some of the world leading experts in global health. A special thanks to the four panelists who, despite their very busy agenda in this challenging time, have accepted to join us today. These amazing panelists are leading efforts in fighting COVID-19 and will be discussing how together we can find solutions to better protect health workers who are on the front line in the fight against COVID-19 to protect all of us around the world. Let me present them by alphabetic order. So uh, I'm going to present Dr. Ed Kelly. He is the director of the Department of Integrated Health Services in the Universal Health Coverage and Life Course Division at the WHO headquarters at Gen in Geneva. Prior to join the joining WHO, Dr. Ed Kelly directed the U.S. National Healthcare Report for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services in the Agency of Healthcare Research and Quality. Dr. Ed Edward Kelly has also directed 28 countries in healthcare quality improvement project at the OECD, as he was certainly during those days spending nights and days to think since nine months how to overcome this pandemic. He is with us today because he, at WHO he leads the health system and service for the organization COVID response efforts. 
The second person I will present is Fauzia. So Dr. Fauzia Akhtahuda is a public health specialist and the project coordinator of ICDDRB. ICDDRB is a famous research institute in Dhaka, multi-awarded institute of research. In her work, she has contributed to a wide range of research studies to improve maternal health and identifying the underlying social and health system factors impacting maternal mortality and morbidity. She is with us today because she has 26 years track record of working experience with different parts of Bangladesh government's health system. A special thank to Dr. Fosia because it's very late in Bangladesh and despite that she has joined us. The third panelist is Dr. Guizepe Raviola better known as Bepi across the world. He is an assistant professor of, psych of psychiatry and global health and social medicine at Harvard Medical School. He is the director of mental health for partner in health and the director of the program in global mental health and social change at Harvard Medical School. He serves as Harvard lead for the Rwanda Human Resource for Health program in psychiatry. He was also trained in child and adolescent psychiatry and learn about the, the, the delivery of rural mental health care in the US context and gain a lot of experience in mental health system of care in various country. Is here today to discuss mental health component of the COVID-19 response. Our fourth panelist, the last by alphabetical order, but not the least, is Dr. Raji Tajuddin. Dr. Raj is a medical doctor with postgraduate qualification in pediatrics and public health. He is a fellow of the West African College of Physicians and an African Public Health Leaders Fellow at the Shapton House Royal Institute of International Affairs in UK. He has years of senior level experience in many fields, many. I will just name a few. Maternal and child health, and health in humanitarian emergencies throughout the developing world. He is currently the head of Public Health Institute and Research at the African Center of Disease Control and Prevention, based at Addis, in Addis Abeba, where he coordinate the establishment and strengthening of public health institute across 55 African countries, member of the African Union. He currently had the healthcare preparedness and response section of the African CDC for the COVID response. So this is the panelists we have, great experts, great leaders in global health. And again, I welcome you all and thank you for joining us today. Before we drive into the discussion, let me begin by asking each of you, dear panelists, to comment in your biggest concern right now in terms of health worker safety. I'm going to ask you your comment on two immediate challenge that you that we face in addressing health, sec, uh, uh, health worker safety and the possible solution that you will take. Imagine that you have a silver bullet. So I'm going to start by you, Dr. Edward Kelly. What is it you believe you will do if you had a magic bullet for worker safety at the time of COVID. Yeah, thank you so much, and yes, and greetings to everybody um, from around the world, and particularly in uh, Rwanda from the WHO executive uh, boardroom. I'm sitting in Dr. Tedros's seat, so I feel very uh, empowered to to say this, and and um, also worked. It's just really such an honor to. Uh, 
be here with uh, Dr. Agnes. We've worked for many years on issues of quality and safety, and she's been a big support to, to the organization. Uh, for me, fully recognizing, being health systems people, uh, the folks on the call, and also Dr. Agnes and, and myself, we don't fully believe in magic bullets, but I know we're suspending our belief at the moment and saying if we could do something. For me, the two things that would have the biggest impact on health worker safety and patient safety at the same time would be if we could create in all organizations a learning culture. So that means blame-free, and it means that you're able to investigate the hardest measurement in healthcare, which is patient safety. Nobody wants to talk about it, so it's very hard to measure and very hard to improve. Second, magic bullets uh, sort of change that I would say would be real engagement of patients and their families. Uh, my own mother passed away from a preventable uh, infection in one of the best hospitals in New York City when I was younger. It's the reason I got into global health. And when the team came in, after she had passed, the, as she was declining rapidly with sepsis, no one spoke to us. No one talked to us and no one talked to us afterwards because of the issues and fears about legal complaints and other uh, issues. So real, that's what patients and families are wanting, real engagement. That, those would be my two points, uh, Dr. Agnes. Those are very deep and fantastic uh, two points. Learning culture and real patient and family engagement. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Edward. Dr. Fozia, what will it be for you? Uh, thank you and welcome everyone. Uh, so I would highlight about one of the most important challenges in our country. As you know, that uh, there is an acute shortage of medical professionals doctors, nurses, and medical staff members. According to WHO, Bangladesh's doctor-to-patient ratio is only 5.26 per 10,000 people, so, uh, which is the second lowest in South Asia. So an example of such a case of a doctor in one of the COVID-19 hotspots, even on the day the doctor tested positive, he was working a 17-hour shift and continued to tend to his patients over the phone while he stayed in isolation. So this is one of the greatest challenge. And uh, the second thing I wanted to focus that the situation is getting worse with COVID-19. More frontline workers are now testing positive. And according to the Doctors Foundation, doctors now make up 6.5% of total cases. Uh, so 25% of doctors and 60% of support staff are yet to receive the PPE, which is another big challenge, the logistics. So with reports to substandard PPEs flooding the market, this is also a uh, big challenge. So uh, regarding the solution, I think access to the telemedicine services, separate medical groups by area so that they can call specific number for medical advice and uh, also if I have the power or the magic bullet like this, so hiring doctors, nurses, medical technologists to deepen the human resources to tackle the virus and training for sample collection, supplies of PPE and uh, also greater coordination between the public and private sector is required to improve the healthcare standards. And also I would uh, emphasize uh, that is, investment should be made for mass testing and in setting up specialized quarantine facilities as well. Also, health sector allocation should be increased. Uh, that is one of the important thing. And uh, the government is taking some good initiatives, but the private entities should also come forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's, um, you give us a lot of uh, information and data. And uh, what you will work on will be organization, protection, and logistics. Thank you, Dr. Fauzia. Uh, Dr. Ravioli. My, uh, my thoughts on this are that organizations um, really need to think about the mental health component of um, healthcare worker wellness 
and the situation with COVID. Not to forget about challenges staff are facing with increased workload, fear of contagion for themselves and their families, working with new and frequently uh, changing protocols in PPE, and also the lack of PPE is a huge stressor for healthcare workers. We're caring for patients and, uh, who are sick and deteriorating and, and working with families. And then of course, caring for colleagues who are ill and you know, when we think about the fact that prior to COVID, the leading cause of disability globally and disability adjusted life years were mental health problems. And now we think about the addition of COVID, we really have to attend to uh, risk of depression and anxiety, acute stress reactions, which people recover from and post-traumatic stress. And we need to think about chronic stress and its effects on the body but we also don't want to confuse mental health problems with the issue of moral distress and moral injury that healthcare workers are facing when they don't have the tools to address treatable problems. And so that leaves um, providers and healthcare workers with, a re with, with almost an existential crisis. So we, we want to attend to mental health, but we don't want to over pathologize. And in terms of solutions, we have to uh, take care of community volunteers and outreach workers and community health workers who are, who are at risk and working in communities, thinking about prioritizing them, for example, with PPE. We need to consider uh, mental health providers and their work with patients and, and take carefully into consideration the fact that if we're also asking them to care for healthcare workers, we're adding to their stress. So to think about adding resources, if you can, for mental health and psychosocial and wellness care for healthcare staff, if they don't exist. And then we have to prioritize service providers within organizations who become infected. In terms of silver bullets, well, I would suggest considering needs assessments to assess staff wellness needs within organizations and to consider developing peer support initiatives that don't just include clinical support and mental health services, but also include peer support, both group and individual, trainings and lectures on wellness, and even newsletters and other resources for people to build resiliency and community and solidarity to accompany colleagues, to enhance connections between people within organizations, to support staff, to preserve the role of care delivery, mental health program teams, and to avoid burnout, increase retention, and help people to better manage their stress. And to also, in the spirit of what was said about learning culture, to share lessons across sites, programs, and organizations. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Raviola. I think you have, uh, in the next session of this webinar, time to develop all those points. Thank you very much. Dr. Raj, can we listen from you? All right. Um, thank you, Prof. And um, it's um, great to connect with you again. I bring you all greetings from John Nkegasong, Director of Africa CDC, um, whose panel I'm using right behind me. I'm not sitting on his seat, but I'm using his uh, backdrop. So um, I, I haven't said that um, a prof and um, um, colleagues um, on this um, webinar. For us as um, Africa CDC and um, as African Union, two key challenges that is um, that has evolved uh, throughout this COVID-19 pandemic is one, shortage of personal protective equipment. As we all know, there is global shortage of this critical um, supply as far as our COVID-19 response is concerned. The other key challenge for us at Africa CDC is gap in knowledge and skills as far as infection prevention and control is concerned. So these are the two key um, challenges I would like um, to focus on. Uh, in terms of uh, what can we do, you know, to try as much as possible to mitigate some of these um, challenges, which is what um, Africa CDC is doing. It's one to set up um, a kind of technical working group 
specifically addressing the infection prevention and control challenges on the continent. And what this team has been able to do is to scale up capacity building initiatives throughout the 55 our member states. First with TOT and secondly with step down um, training using those resources that were developed to the TOT. Secondly, in terms of the PPE, that's the personal protective equipment, what our political leaders have done under the leadership of President Cyril Ramaphosa of South Africa and the private sector is to put in place a pool procurement platform called African Medical Supplies Platform that will allow each and every member state to have equitable and affordable access to these critical medical supplies, PPE. And through the same platform, even if you are a member state, inability to pay does not preclude you from having access because we have our development banks, Abrazin Bank and Africa Development Bank have provided some sort of um, financial um, coverage for this, our, our member state. So I will stop there and i um, hoping to expand further when we move to the next um, section of the webinar. Absolutely. Over. Thank you so much, Dr. Raj. You have take, tackled the major point for the continent. Now I'm going to ask you to give your overview on the subject. And the, the, the order will be you first, Dr. Kelly, after Dr. Fozia, and after you, Dr. Raj, and uh, the, we will end with uh, Dr. Raviola. So um, we can start if, uh, yes. Great, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Agnes, and, and it was great listening to colleagues. I think we um, have a set of slides that are going to be shown from, uh, um, from your side, but Paul, tell me it's different. Yes, there we are. So next slide, please. For me, my job is to just frame briefly this World Patient Safety Day that's uh, become now um, just one of a few, very few uh, global days that WHO uh, maintains, and it's and try to do it in just a few minutes. Uh, obviously, World Patient Safety Day and the movements and the work on patient safety dates back uh, two decades to uh, publications done in the UK, the US, and many other places um, that looked at the fact that we don't always perfectly deliver healthcare. Back then, that was a big uh, eye opener, and now it's something that we understand very well. And the COVID 19 pandemic has brought it into stark relief. We're very fond of saying at WHO, and Dr. Tedros says this often, that uh, the outbreak didn't create any problems except a new virus, but it's shown the light on many gaps that we have in our systems uh, here. So it's now, we feel, one of the biggest crises that the world is facing and certainly the biggest crisis in patient safety ever. Next slide, please. Um, this year we've launched on uh, the 17th of November of September, the uh, um, World Patient Safety Day theme, which is uh, focused on the interrelationship between health worker safety and patient safety. Next slide. The slogan is safe health workers, safe patients. And as I mentioned uh, and talked about earlier, it's something that has been long recognized uh, within different parts of the healthcare delivery uh, spectrum, but we've approached it in very different ways, either from an occupational health uh, standpoint, or from a health worker and health worker rights standpoint, or from a patient safety side. And the time's come to really bring all that together. Next slide, please. The calls for action that are part of the World Patient Safety Day really try to touch on all parts of both the health system and on civil society, on patients, families, and the communities in which they live. So we have uh, calls to action for patients, family members, and caregivers, uh, also for civil society organizations, but we also have calls to action for professional associations and international organizations, health workers, policymakers, regulators, parliamentarians, et cetera, as well as academic and research institutions and healthcare leaders. Next slide, please. On this day in particular, we have launched a, a charter for health worker safety, which is, uh, builds on the history that WHO has had over the years. Uh, we started, when I first started with WHO many years ago, I won't say how many, uh, working on patient safety. One of the first things we worked on were global challenges on patient safety, and we asked 
ministers of health and, and uh, Dr. Anya has helped us uh, at these times to commit to um, uh, hand hygiene, for instance, signing a, a charter or a pledge uh, for patient safety. So this is builds on that tradition, but we've launched a more comprehensive approach on it this time, looking at a charter for health worker safety, which has uh, a range uh, or has a, a set of uh, priority areas. We've also have several technical products that have come out today, new guidance on uh, reporting and learning systems, as well as uh, new information on uh, healthcare worker infections. And we've got a set of patient safety goals that we will use as an organization working with countries to try and track our progress over time so that in a year's time, we'll come back and say how we've done. It's really a day and it's, the charter is also a piece of paper, but it's really about what happens in using that charter and in working through the year at a local level that will make a difference in terms of health worker safety and patient safety. Next slide, please. One of the signature marks of World Patient Safety Day are lighting up the monuments in orange. Uh, and Dr. Anis, it's honor. I've uh, worn my one orange tie, uh, so uh, it's, I can't light the room up uh, in orange here at uh, WHO. But this is a picture of the famous um, Jedo with a, a very large uh, uh, fountain in the center of uh, Geneva's part of Lake Geneva uh, that was lit up uh, in orange last year. will be lit up again uh, this evening uh, in orange and getting pictures from around the world of famous monuments lit up uh, in orange. Next slide. So some of the challenges and solutions that we faced this year, just to frame and then, then the it's WHO's job to frame some of these and then my esteemed uh, colleagues will be addressing some of them in the, in the following presentations. But next slide, please. Some of the work that uh, has been mentioned even just a, a minute ago are around the fact that health workers have been exposed to a range of hazards in their day-to-day -day work. And in particular, the strains we talk about now with COVID are around infections, i.e. biological hazards or the strains and the risk to mental health as the surge in patient, um, uh, surge in COVID patients meant that they had to work long hours, extra hours, and people were repurposed uh, to different uh, roles and responsibilities. But in fact, there's a whole range, including chemical, physical exposure to violence and discrimination that uh, are part of what WHO and its partner organizations, we've, the charter is being jointly uh, promoted anyway, at least it's not a joint charter, but with the International Labor Organization and health workers, these are, this is not a new situation. It's a particularly acute one, but health workers are under strain uh, uh, have, and have been so for some time. Uh, and it's only exacerbated by the global shortage we have that our colleagues in health workforce often cite of 18, a shortage of 18 million by the year 2030. Next slide, please. So uh, some of the numbers that, that we're able to report today that around 14%, at least of what's been reported to WHO, of COVID cases are health workers. And it's uh, quite high, but even in some of the countries reporting back to us, it's as high as 35%. On July 23rd, our uh, uh, regional director reported that a survey of 40 African countries found around 10,000 health workers have been infected with COVID-19. And on uh, the 2nd of September in the Americas, more than 570,000 cases uh, reported among health workers uh, across that region. Next slide, please. So these are some of the determining factors and challenges of both the, the setting and level of exposure, but also workload and stress. We, we flagged the issue of personal protective equipment and can come back to it in the, in the Q&A a bit later. Um, WHO has been very involved uh, because of the global market breakdown on PPE earlier in the outbreak and continues to be. But there's a, uh, you know, sort of having PPE is just really one small piece of it. As someone who's worked on IPC and PPE for a very long time, uh, it's really the organizational measures. Do health workers know how to put it on, take it off, how to use it properly? What are the, and do they have equipment that fits them? Then there's staffing levels. Um, and in fact, most health workers are not getting infected at work. They're getting infected with COVID in when, if they do get infected in the community. And so, uh, having social health protection for uh, health workers and, and looking at community transmission will be an important element here. Next slide, please. The mental health consequences have been great also, and very, it's great uh, that we have uh, colleagues from Harvard to, to um, talk more about this given their expertise, but uh, during that pandemic, at least what's been reported to WHO, one in three health workers have reported uh, suffering from insomnia, 
and one in four of health workers suffering depression, anxiety. And uh, what's also worrying is that it's higher in certain uh, populations, uh, uh, even more so than, than one in four. And it's quite clear that there are links to patient safety here in, term with, in terms of mental health, uh, the, in terms of both physicians and the strain on them, but the strain across the health workers. And when we talk about health workers, we don't just mean care workers, we mean also uh, the cleaners the, and other people not involved just with direct care. Next slide, please. So I just conclude with that in terms of framing some of the issues for us, uh, Dr. Agnes, and I think it'll be an opportunity to get into more depth as we go through with the other panelists. Back over to you. Thank you for your presentation, uh, Dr. Kelly. We are now going to listen to Dr. Fauzia. Yeah, thank you very much. So, okay, I, would, uh, I have some slides, Paul. Yeah, thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, so just my friend from WHO has shown or shown us many data and I am using their data as well. So according to the WHO recent situation report in Bangladesh, which is published on 14th September. So between, as you know, that in Bangladesh, the first case was identified in on 8th of March uh, 2020. So between 8th March and 14th September 2020, according to the Directorate of Health Services press release, there were uh, 339,332 confirmed cases, including 4,759 related deaths. And out of the total cases registered, 71.7% recovered 1.4% died, and 26.9% are active cases. So this is the current situation of COVID-19 in Bangladesh. Next slide, please. Uh, so you can see here in the reported week, that is the last week, uh, 37th week, uh, we are now we are in uh, 38th week, so in the reported week, number of new cases decreased by 13.8%, while the number of new weekly deaths increased by 10.8%. Uh, that is, uh, last week, the um, uh, last week death was uh, 254, and uh, now it's uh, 231. Uh, so. Uh, leading the infection fatality ratio a little increase from 1.38% in last week to 1.4% in the current week. But the case fatality ratio decreased from 1.98% to 1.93% in the current week. So these are the uh, weekly distribution of uh, confirmed cases and deaths in the country. Next slide, please. Uh, here you can see the cases, hospitalized cases and recovered cases. So my intention uh, to show this slide is to how many of them, the cases, you can see here that many of them are hospitalized and many of them are going to the hospital. And uh, the recovery rate is almost the same, uh, that is uh, throughout the weeks, different weeks. So many of the cases who are hospitalized, so many of, that is most of the healthcare providers are facing or treating these cases. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now data on our frontline health workers and COVID-19. So this is, uh, according to this, is not very updated data, but we found according to the Bangladesh Medical Association on July 30, 2020. So a total 3,164 health workers, including 1,003 doctors have tested positive across the country. Uh, and 92 doctors of government and private hospitals have died after showing symptoms of COVID-19. Also, the latest uh, data, which was updated on July 30th, there were uh, 2,458 doctors who have contacted the virus, raising the number of infections among other 
and other health workers to 7,086. And intensive, uh, that is uh, to highlight the severity of the case, some of the intensive care units and genile wards of as many as 11 hospitals across the country had to be closed down after healthcare workers were infected. Next, please. So why are we concerned? The frontline health workers are at high risk of developing COVID-19 as they have to come in direct contact with the patients during their clinical interactions. And also if not diagnosed early, healthcare workers can also be a potential source of infection to other patients who are non-COVID and other health workers. So uh, what, what is needed? appropriate infection prevention and control measures, which is very much essential, but very much lacking in our country setting and in many other settings in Asia, I think. So why do we need this? Uh, to understand the burden of COVID-19 infection among the frontline health workers and to identify the risk factors for adverse outcomes. These are essential to promote the IPC. Next, please. Well, so what are the gaps in safety of the concern for the frontline healthcare workers? Uh, as I mentioned in my earlier uh, statement, that is the challenges we are facing every day, lack of human resources. There is a huge shortage of human resources. So the healthline uh, healthcare workers have to perform their duties very frequently and so often that there are very small gap between the two shifts of duties. And sometimes the patient's height being a COVID-19 carrier and travel history in virus heat areas, which do infect the health workers as well. There are lack of trained and skilled manpower in the health services. And as this is a new virus, we are not much uh, aware or not much knowledgeable about these uh, from the beginning and uh, lack of technologists because the sample collection, we have not that much skill hand to collect the samples as well. So there are lack of trained and skilled manpower in every sector. And also at least two people are needed to do off a PPE in a right manner. Otherwise it could contaminate others. So to wear the PPE and to open the PPE, you need help from some others. So there is also, there is shortage of human resources. Who can help you? So I think that's all from my side. Next, please, Paul. Yeah, thank you very much. That is from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Fauzia. Now, Dr. Raj, we are going to listen to you. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Prof. So, uh, colleagues, I'm not going to uh, make any PowerPoint presentation because my understanding was this was going to be purely panel um, discussion. But having said that, I appreciate um, colleagues who have um, taken the mic or the floor before me. So, by way of um, statistics, the, the, the first case on the continent actually came in on the 14th of February this year. And as of today, we are looking at over 1.3 million cases on the continent of 1.3 billion um, population. And in terms of um, death, we have um, around uh, 33 to 35,000 um, deaths, which is just around 5% of the global um, total. The good news is that more than 80% of our cases have actually um, recovered. And then um, looking at our um, projection or looking at the epic curve, we are seeing a downward trend in the um, epic of once again apology that I didn't come with um, a powerpoint we have moved from 100 to 120000 cases towards the end of july to around 50000 um, cases per week currently so meaning we are having around 50% drop in the um, uh, weekly um, cases of um, covid-19 on the continent so let me shift gear and go to ipc um, specifically most of our member states actually do not have um, IPC measures in place. And this was quite obvious at the outset of this COVID-19. And one of the key areas that we started our capacity building exercise from was that of um, IPC, 
where we brought 37 member states together in um, Abuja, Nigeria for the uh, English speaking country and uh, in Cote d'Ivoire for the Francophone um, countries. And this was a training that we jointly organized with WHO um, Afro just to do a TOT sort of training and to follow that up with a um, step down training in our, our respective uh, member states. Still on um, statistics, as far as IPC measures is concerned, an assessment that was done by um, WHO um, this year actually showed that 16% out of our 30,000 facilities had what we call a good IPC measure. So meaning that the remaining 84% were just nowhere near what is an ideal situation for infection prevention and um, control. Quite a lot of the facilities lack uh, infrastructure to implement what is needed for IPC. And less than 10% of this facility are uh, what we describe as isolation and facility. And in terms of a triaging of patients, which is very, very critical when you talk of infection prevention and control, more than 70% of the facility do not have what it takes to triage a patient. So with all this, you agree with me that the magnitude or the burden or the, 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 the challenge is quite huge as far as IPC is concerned on the continent. Again, try to unpack the IPC um, situation on the continent. Data from 38 or 55 uh, member states actually show that the, the, the rate varies from 6% in Cote d'Ivoire to 16% in um, Sierra Leone, again, which is not far from what um, Kelly has uh, presented from the global um, perspective. So as Africa CDC, what have we done? I think our greatest strength as Africa CDC is that of coordination. A week after the first case was identified on the continent, the ministers of health from the 55 member states came together in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia to agree on what should be a continent-wide strategy and to also agree on what sort of tax force should drive this strategy. And President Cyril Ramaphosa, as the chair of the union, also set up a committee of envoys, about five of them, to drive what sort of resources do we need to be able to respond to this collectively as a continent. And this has really, really helped immensely. Now, in terms of um, specifics, the technical working group on IPC, apart from carrying out um, training, TOT and step down training, they have also produced all sorts of guidelines that is applicable to different settings. Guideline on um, ambulance, guideline on um, discharge criteria, guideline on home management of mild to asymptomatic COVID-19 cases. So all those sort of guidelines that will prevent um, infection within, um, this, um, in, within the community. One other thing they have also done is to bring together the PPE manufacturers across the continent and also brought in the Africa Continental Free Trade um, Area, brought in some um, experts from overseas country on how do we ensure technology transfer, how do we build local capacity, how do we provide the necessary financial resources that we allow our local manufacturers to be able to roll out or produce some of these PPEs on the continent and be able to bridge some of the um, global um, gap as far as the IPC uh, materials are concerned. Another technical working group that was also set up that has responded immensely to this um, uh, IPC uh, or patient or, or healthcare workers are safety on the continent is a technical working group on supply uh, chain management. So they have been able to handle the issue of um, logistics. They were part and parcel of the African Medical Supply Platform that is guaranteeing equitable and affordable access to these uh, personal protective um, equipment. We also have a technical working group that is looking at risk communication and community engagement. As we all know, stigma and discrimination against our health workers is something that is not acceptable. And in line with this, the technical working group on risk communication and community engagement have been able to engage virtually everybody, ranging from the, the faith-based organization, the civil society organizations, the journalists, traditional um, healers, vendors. We are able to carry everybody along so that, uh, I mean, as much as possible, able to reduce issue of stigma and violence against our healthcare workers. Then the lab technical working group have also come up with a testing protocol that will allow a sort of um, routine um, uh, regularly scheduled sort of um, testing for our healthcare workers so that we're able to identify those who are infected um, early and institute appropriate um, measure. So again, 
we continue to enjoy a lot of political um, support right from um, the top there up to um, the technical um, level. And every week we meet to discuss and agree on what has worked very well, what has not worked, what do we need to improve um, upon. So a combination of a lot of um, things that naturally help the way Africa CDC has responded to this COVID-19, and more in particular, to guarantee safety of our um, healthcare workers. And last but not the least, for those member states who have critical shortage of healthcare workers, we have been able to mobilize from other uh, member states, for instance, epidemiologists from DR Congo have been mobilized to most of these French speaking countries in West Africa to support them and to address some of these uh, critical um, shortage. Currently, we are supporting member states with community health workers, you know, in the spirit of tax shifting, you know, with appropriate supervision, so as also to bridge the gap in terms of um, shortage. And um, let me um, conclude by saying that as much as possible, mental health and psychosocial support is key to preventing healthcare workers and infection. And in this regard, we've been able to roll out a lot of initiative to drive this uh, particular um, aspect of um, the response. So let me stop there and um, hand over back to the chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Raj. Uh, Dr. Raviola, i just uh, present you your overview before we drive into questions with the participants. Oh, yes. Um, some of what I'll say comes from uh, my experience as a psychiatrist, but I also direct mental health for Partners in Health, which is an organization that works with ministries of health to strengthen health systems. And I, I, I work in the area of, of pushing in the mental health services. Next slide, please. And we have to appreciate the complexity of COVID-19 that um, here on the left, you have the first wave of immediate mortality and morbidity with the first wave tail of post IC recovery. Important to remember that we're learning that COVID-19 attacks the brain um, as it does other organs in the body. And then you see these second and third waves of the impact of resource restriction on urgent non-COVID conditions and the impact of interrupted care on chronic conditions. And we have to appreciate the role of comorbidity, that, that many patients have multiple conditions and mental health is intertwined with all of this. And then of course you have this fourth wave of psychic trauma, mental illness, economic injury and burnout. So at, at WHO it's been said, um, it's been emphasized to build back better from disasters and humanitarian crises. And I just want to say that we've got to strengthen mental health services within health systems um, as part of this discussion. Next slide. I mentioned um, the challenges for staff and we'll move to the next slide from this one. Um, I just want to share a couple resources. Um, next slide, please. Yes, thank you. Um, there's a nice paper on mental health care for medical staff and affiliated health workers in the European Heart Journal, Walton, Murray, and Christian. And I just wanna uh, mark it for you if you're interested because there's some excellent recommendations. Next slide, please. And I mentioned the importance of separating mental illness from the moral injury and the existential challenge that all people working within health systems are facing. We saw this in many parts of the world with HIV, when there were no antiretroviral medications, when we knew that treatments were available in other parts of the world. And we have a different but similar phenomenon here with COVID that we, we know that so much of what healthcare workers are dealing with is preventable. So we have to support healthcare workers in that while also appreciating the risks of depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress, and chronic stress. Next slide. The other thing that we have to appreciate and educate people about is the fact that the acute stress reactions that healthcare workers are going to face are normal reactions, most of which recover. And so we need to leave some space for people to recover, but we also have to acknowledge that this is a marathon here with COVID with no end really in sight. And so that also is taking its own toll. Next slide, please. One other document important to look at is the Interagency Standing Committee Operational Considerations for Multisectoral Mental Health and Psychosocial Support Programs During the COVID-19 Pandemic. 
there's a lot in there that will be helpful to organizations thinking about um, solutions. Next slide, please. And um, in the index of that document, you'll find um, areas focused on healthcare workers. Next slide. And I mentioned uh, considerations around working with community volunteers and outreach workers, the, the role of education about how to work safely, principles of physical distancing, um, providing people with safe communication means, um, discussing how home visits can be done in the safest and most acceptable way, ensuring ongoing remote support, supervision, and education, and um, helping community volunteers dispel myths and stigma around COVID and coordinating the work across key health sectors, health, protection, nutrition. Next slide. Other considerations around self-care of staff, of mental health teams. Um, the mental health teams themselves need support. And remember what I said prior, that we've got to build additional services for healthcare workers. We can't doubly burden mental health providers with their patient load, which is growing, and working with colleagues. We have to think in creative ways. We have to find the budgets to, to build these supports. And in this um, IASC document, there are a number of very helpful considerations around self-care and staff care of mental health teams. Next slide, please. And then of course, we have to support service providers within organizations who become infected with COVID. We have to ensure that they receive appropriate medical care and advice. We need to engage in contact tracing within organizations we need to inform service users who have been in contact with those staff members. We need to provide the emotional support to staff, and we need to also take the additional measures to deep clean and disinfect the facilities where the staff members are working to also support their mental health. Next slide, please. At Partners in Health in Lesotho and Malawi, in August, we started to engage in needs assessments around staff wellness. And what I will say is, you know, People um, generally have less familiarity within health systems on how to build mental health programs, but it's very feasible and doable. And needs assessments are a key first step in doing that. And what we found, not surprising, was there was acute stress and traumatic experience compounding work stress. There was significant concern and remains regarding colleagues who've tested positive to COVID this issue of chronic stress and the marathon with no end to sight was profound for people. And there was concern regarding people's own test results and exposure. Next slide. And in response to that, we're building a staff wellness program and we've asked ourselves, what would an ideal staff wellness and peer support initiative look like? And the answer we've come up with is that it's not just clinical support and mental health services, although that's critically important. It also includes peer support, trainings and lectures on wellness and newsletters with resources. And so I just want to end, next slide please, by encouraging you to consider the role of staff wellness and peer support initiatives for, from a variety of perspectives and for a variety of reasons. But primarily during this COVID-19 era, we need to build resiliency, community, solidarity, and we need to accompany colleagues and we don't want to recreate the wheel. We want to share lessons across sites, programs, organizations, and nations. Thank you. So true, uh, Dr. Raviola. Mm -hmm. So your presentation were fantastic, very informative of what happened around the world and in different uh, section of the fight against COVID. And I'm sure that our participants are ready with questions to dig more in the important fact that the four of us have shared in this previous session. But before to go into the discussion, uh, first let me thank all the participants who have sent already their question in advance. And uh, I want to uh, insist on the fact that we also take new questions as participants are listening to you panelists, so they can use for that the Q&A feature. 
The first question is directed to you, Dr. Kelly. What do you believe are the root causes for the limited access to PPE that health workers are experiencing globally? For example, do you believe that this may be an outcome of the institutional practice of rationing resources in order to achieve cost effectiveness? Yeah, great. Um, it's a great question. Uh, and as someone yeah, who lived in many parts of the world, I did most of my doctoral work, for instance, in Niger, when it had the highest child mortality in the world. It's going to soon compete again for that very unfortunate uh, title. But um, uh, and one of the big issues was, of course, uh, supply chain and supplies. Um, and there was always the effort to make more go farther and to come up with some sort of uh, to re reuse. And, and uh, so, of course, there's safe reuse and rational reuse and unsafe reuse. We have spent many years trying to move away from the reuse of syringes and um, trying to improve injection safety. Um, there, WHO has put out guidance on the uh, rational use of personal protective equipment. I'll, when I get a minute, I will paste it in the chat. Um, and I would really encourage people to look at that. There are um, approaches that can help people stretch their, for instance, PPE farther. But one thing I would flag, like for instance, at the beginning of the outbreak, we had a huge market breakdown in personal protective equipment around the world. There just was not enough. And, and unfortunately, as has happened before with other supplies and big events, um, it was bought up uh, immediately. Uh, the Secretary General put WHO at the head of the UN's supply chain operation, which for those of you who don't know, is very substantial uh, with UNICEF, the World Food Program, multiple, multiple uh, 747s flying around the world, delivering uh, different supplies of diagnostics and also PPE, we have shipped three, as of this week, 371 million units of PPE, which is, includes 22 million respirators, 39 million masks, uh, two and a half million gloves. So this is, um, there's a lot of, we're in a better place than when we started, but one of the things that we are finding, uh, because colleagues mentioned it um, here from where they're seeing in their countries, the shortage and people's concerns on PPE. We've done a survey of countries uh, looking at what are the biggest challenges um, you have in terms of serving COVID patients and keeping regular health services running. The availability of PPE is not the top one. Um, actually, the top one is that people aren't showing up. So maybe one of your questions that we'll get, Dr. Agnes, is around trust and, and when will people trust to come back to health services. But it is an important one. But no one has a good idea of what the actual need at the front line is. Um, people, uh, we do have a, a global picture of what theoretically based on a uh, caseload would be needed to serve um, uh, patients uh, suffering from COVID, uh, but we don't know what is in countries. And actually many countries have, a, have an incomplete picture of what their stocks, their strategic stockpile is on PPE and where does it sit? In many countries, it sits in the capital city, not out in the periphery. So I think there, are, all in your question there is both rational use uh, issues, actual overall supply, and then the supply chain. How do we get that PPE to the front line and get people uh, using it uh, are, are all big questions. We w are gonna be launching a set um, with our regional offices and country offices, a set of facility surveys rapid surveys to look at some of this and hope to have a better picture of the coming weeks, but clearly it's something we'll need to wrestle with as we go forward. Back to you, Dr. Agnes. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. You have uh, given a great explanation on, the, on your view and the view, the situation of the global uh, uh, shortage of PPE and the solution that are on the way. But you tackle a new problem about keeping ongoing the ordinary services, even when the, the health workers are there, patients are not showing up because they don't trust that they will be kept uh, safe. This is a very important uh, issue because in some country it is dramatic. Um, I, we have, uh, I'm going to complement your answer by adding what, how Rwanda have managed it. 
in Rwanda, when you are at risk, you, you are not allowed to go to a health center. There is a phone number you call. And you know that in each village, 200 houses, there are four phones uh, dedicated to health by four community health workers. So the, the district or the, the district send an ambulances to pick you, bring you to a center for testing. And if you are positive, bring you directly to a center specific for COVID treatment so that there is no uh, there is no contact with ordinary services that have continued and the data give, uh, uh, the data are very good, no dropout in um, delivery, for example. But uh, these are important subjects to reflect on. Dr. Fauzia, I would like to ask you a question more specific to Bangladesh, such as the frequent flood flooding that you face in Bangladesh, how does this impact the worker safety on top of the pandemic and for the pandemic care and also the ongoing flow of refugees? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, that's a huge issue because uh, the flood now with uh, we have uh, this COVID issue and there is ongoing flood and also the refugee committee, you know. So uh, first of all, the flood in the flood areas, first important um, challenge is uh, the infrastructure in most of the areas, particularly in the coastal belt of the country. Uh, this is a huge issue that the roads, transports and uh, the ports, those are not uh, well developed. And so as of uh, the logistics and supplies, which are very much um, lacking in the normal areas. So during flood, uh, it is really becoming a very a, a big challenge to reach to the center with the logistics. And um, also the other important issue is that, uh, that most of the healthcare workers a uh, majority wanted to stay in the urban areas. So the flood affected areas are already lacking behind of the human resources, the healthcare providers. So uh, that is also another important issue. So this is important, that is ensuring uh, the recruitment and uh, appropriate deployment of human resources uh, to the health facilities in the flood affected areas particular and uh, make it more um, that is uh, the area friendly or uh, responsive to the needs and demands of the population as well. Also the readiness of the facility. The, in the flood affected areas, the facilities are already also affected, uh, <clears throat> sorry, at the same level. So these facilities are not ready to provide the uh, services properly. And uh, uh, the other important issue I would like to highlight uh, with PPE and everything that biosafety hazard, this is also a big issue, the disposal, the management of this waste, the PPEs, the gloves, the mask and everything. We are facing this problem very much that uh, keeping not every facilities or the healthcare providers also very much trained on these uh, waste disposal or biosafety disposal. So uh, these issues are important and I think uh, need to be um, think and need to be thought about uh, these things uh, as well. Uh, and also among the Rohingya community, the important is issue is the meats. My friend, uh, my colleague, already mentioned uh, many things about the mental health and uh, the beats and the uh, stigmas. So this is very, as you know, the refugee community is already in trouble. So they uh, don't want to mention uh, the problems uh, they are facing due to this COVID. Uh, so they always want to hide. And uh, the healthcare workers are facing problem because uh, the, the community doesn't uh, mention 
about their problem and the healthcare workers are becoming more infected or affected due to these infections. So um, these are the important issues, uh, I think, uh, most importantly. So I think uh, some planning policy guidelines and guidance for the local government and uh, input to that is uh, adaptive engineering design in the infra infrastructure, they like roads, ports, and user-friendly shelter centers for the uh, communities and for the healthcare workers as well. This is needed. And uh, as my, our country is very much, uh, that is uh, disaster prone in many of the cases. So some system for the climate sensitive uh, disease surveillance system should be in place. And especially, particularly uh, this situation like this pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Fauzia. Uh, a lot of organization uh, to be put in place and that uh, really uh, uh, is another way to demonstrate that COVID really highlight pre-existing problem more than any disease ever. And you're also raising an important problem that is waste management that could make the post-COVID era a nightmare. Uh, where all those gloves and uh, plastic will go. So this need uh, to be also reflect on. Dr. Raj, tell me, how do you prioritize the safety of the healthcare workers during pandemics in the context of limited human resource and an overwhelming number of patients? You have tackled that with task shifting, but could you uh, give more information at the request of this participant? All right. Um, thank you. Thank you, um, Prof, for that um, question. So uh, let me start uh, by saying that um, currently um, uh, the healthcare um, workforce capacity on Africa is around um, three per thousand population. <laughs> As against 25 per thousand population, which is really, 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 really huge. So and uh, now um, Africa has also been described as a continent of syndemics, where you have a multiple outbreak occurring at the same time. Uh, you also have the endemic diseases of TB, malaria, HIV, AIDS on one side, non-communicable disease on the other side. And uh, with all this, you have this critical shortage of um, health workforce. So in the context of COVID-19, what uh, we have been able um, to do is um, one, as I mentioned earlier on the issue of a tax, I mean, tax shifting, recruiting community health workers. We have also moved a step ahead, also looking at community volunteers, you know, because we have done this in Ebola in Eastern DRC and it really worked very well. So we are replicating the same model in um, other uh, member states because there are a lot of things that the community volunteers um, can do in terms of bridging the um, critical care, I mean, the critical gap as far as workforce and capacity is um, concerned. So the other thing we've been able to do is to leverage our resources at the disposal of our diaspora community. And they have also played a very, very big role. So we're working along um, um, this direction with um, the Citizen and Diaspora um, Directorate of the African Union to see how the, um, the diaspora community can also play um, a very, very um, important role as far as um, the bridging the workforce and um, capacity is um, concerned. We've also tried to identify uh, those vulnerable and fragile member states because we know that, yes, there is shortage. Uh, but again, the level is not is not a level playing ground for every member state. We, are, we know that some are worse um, hit than others. So for those vulnerable uh, member states, we have uh, been able to support them by moving some resources from those fairly well to do in terms of um, health workforce to those um, other uh, member states. For instance, at the outset of this pandemic, with our Peace and Security Council, despite the fact that it's a lockdown everywhere, we're able to move epidemiologists from DR Congo who had um, access in a way to some countries in um, West Africa to support um, the gap. The other thing we've been able to do is to make use of technology. Um, as uh, Fauzi has um, rightly said, that the issue of um, 
telehealth, telemedicine is very, very critical as far as um, health workforce um, shortages are concerned. For instance, during this COVID-19, for patients on a chronic medications, you don't need to go to the health facility. These are things that we can address by way of remote um, assistance using um, telemedicine. Uh, so also some routine services with the aid of um, technology will be able to, I mean, um, respond to some of these um, issues. Another thing we've been able to do, uh, a, again, in terms of um, shortage is to repurpose some um, facilities, you know, and to also retrain some um, skill um, set. We have seen teachers being able to support uh, the COVID-19 um, response in their own um, little uh, um, way. So these are some of the things we've been able to do. And more importantly, going forward, we are revising our framework for public health workforce um, development to be able to, I mean, looking at some critical and needs and what do we do to take this um, to scale, especially in terms of um, when there's outbreak and uh, during our uh, peace time. Over. Yes. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ranj, for this overview of uh, the great coordination uh, activities that uh, you, the CDC Africa is going to keep all of us on the continent safe. I have here um, another question for you, Dr. Kelly. Many months into the pandemic, health workers are still dying at horrific rates. On the global scale, how do we develop risk perception on healthcare workers? What strategy can be used and implemented? Yeah, I mean, I think this, um, there's a couple of uh, points to make there. It's a good, uh, uh, very good point. First um, point maybe to make is that, uh, although that we're learning more and more about this outbreak uh, every week, every month. But from what we are seeing now, uh, more health workers are getting infected in community settings rather than in uh, healthcare settings. And it makes sense uh, in many ways. Um, uh, so that is something that has a much wider implications. We can concentrate on healthcare uh, facilities and, and the better work, safer work, better availability of PPE for uh, healthcare delivery, but we can still do all that. And if health workers are not paid a proper wage, uh, are sort of um, from uh, working migrant populations who live in difficult uh, uh, parts of their city, who live in crowded conditions, uh, then they will get infected there. And then they either will not be able to work or they bring it back to, uh, to their work. Secondly, we have parts of our healthcare system, which are very different across different parts of the, of the um, uh, world and WHO regions that are very fractured. So if you look at how we take care of our elderly, one of the many parts and many cracks in our system that this COVID uh, pandemic has shown a light on are the big gaps in long-term care and in, and in uh, care for elderly uh, patients. Dr. Tedros had a very passionate moment in this very chair the other day where he called on the world to recognize the, the uh, enormous burden and death of older people uh, from this uh, pandemic and that to to brush it off as somehow not uh, sort of equivalent to our uh, to other deaths and this was a big moral gap that, that we had so but that happens not just because elderly patients are more susceptible which they are but it happens because of it tends to be a very fractured care system and health workers uh, frequently work in multiple locations. They come and go and uh, may not have long-term contracts. So um, it, it's a bit of a, of a more holistic, perhaps, or roundabout answer to your question, uh, Dr. Agnes. But I think um, we are seeing now that we don't, uh, WHO is a bit this way, but many uh, ministries of health are, that we think about we're not uh, sort of ministries of health care. We are ministries of health, and we are not the World Health Care Organization. We're the World Health Organization. So we need to be, in this question of health workers, we need to be looking at both 
uh, the structures and uh, protection within care uh, places, which we have a number of strategies being launched today and, and we've talked about PPE, but we also need to be looking at that uh, wider health uh, issues, mental health, as well as uh, how people live. So, Fauzia, as a woman, I'm going to ask you a question. Across the world, the majority of caregivers are women. And uh, globally, women make up 70% of the health work, healthcare workforce. Based on those data, and those are the healthcare official providers, I don't count the community health workers in any form. So based on those data available for close to, to 100 countries, what in your point of view are the extra measures that need to be taken now and in the future to protect women who are disproportionately on the front line of treating affected patients? For multiple reasons, not only for professional reasons, <coughs> also for domestic reasons, because with, the, with COVID, women have more work at home. With COVID, women has more work at work, like the men. So what do you propose? Well, thank you very much. Yeah, women, uh, that is uh, this situation, the COVID situation, I think uh, taught us many things in addition to this, how to fight with the virus, with the situation, <clears throat> sorry, everything. But uh, also at the same time, uh, in many of the countries, like in Bangladesh, uh, which is a patriarchal society and many of the countries, uh, but uh, during this uh, pandemic, Many of the men are doing household chores, supporting, uh, the, supporting their wives or mothers or sisters or daughters. So uh, somehow the male involvement is uh, vigilant very much somehow. So uh, the most important thing is uh, that I think uh, from the very beginning, as we now know about the situation and maybe we uh, might have to face many other uh, situations like these in the coming days. So um, uh, from the very beginning, I think the women's education and empowerment is important because uh, if I am educated, I'm aware, I may be take care, uh, I may take care of the family, of the person uh, that uh, who, uh, who that is uh, surrounding me. And also at the same time, I think uh, that uh, support to the women from the family members and uh, from professional uh, uh, side as well uh, is very much important and need to be ensured. Because uh, we are, now we are working more uh, than before because uh, during these, uh, pandemic situation when we are uh, doing many things digitally and this in this virtual world, every time the workload is much more than before. Uh, to, before it was eight to five, the office hour, but now I think it's 24 seven. There is no weekend, there is no uh, restriction of timing. So uh, special support for the woman is needed. Um, and uh, as you know, we, we know that uh, during this time, the <clears throat> domestic violence has increased a lot in many of the areas. So we, we must ensure that area and uh, we must see that how we can prevent this. And uh, joblessness and many things is uh, putting women in a uh, much uh, vulnerable situation. So. I think more support is needed from the family, from the society, from government, and from every sector. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fauzia. I think remain only four minutes. So I'm going to ask a question to Ra, Dr. Raj, Raji and Dr. Guzepe. 
However, you have only one minute to answer because we are reaching the end. Raji, different institutions have pointed out the government failure to collect and keep accurate records uh, of death among health workers. What uh, do you propose to change that? All right, um, thank you so much, um, Prof. I, I think the most important, uh, the most important thing here is uh, to put in place a very robust mortality surveillance program. I, I think this is what is lacking, and this one area the Africa CDC has really, really focused even before the outbreak. And for this particular outbreak, we are scaling that up through our rapid mortality surveillance and program. And we are not only doing that; we are also building member state capacity to be able to do that because. Capacity is a big issue as far as the continent is concerned. Over. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Guzepe, it is said that when this pandemic passes, many people will die of hunger and other disease. Can you talk about the ripple effect of this pandemic is having on healthcare workforce and how we can prepare not only for this moment, for the post COVID, but also for this ripple effect? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think if we're using the language of health systems and platforms, my observation has been that in places where preemptive strengthening of mental health services, for example, um, had been done, that the response to COVID was, was more robust from a mental health perspective as well. I think that um, organizations now need to be very proactive about considering how they do the basics of providing, uh, you know, food, drink, rest facilities, mon you know, not letting healthcare providers work extended hours, workload management, role expectations, you know, and the challenge here is the linkage of administration, clinical leadership, human resources, and mental health. All of those things need to be tied together. Within organizations, uh, there needs to be collaboration across those groups in particular so that organizations are ready. And um, basic things need to be done to support staff. And then skills in team leadership, how to be a good leader, how to improve communication, how to empower team members to be their own leaders, operating with a sense of humanity and humility will be essential. Thank you. So I think we are getting at the end of the panel. I have to say you are amazing panelists. Uh, your presentation, your question, uh, responses, etc. Please, all of, all, all of the people who are watching them now, join me in expressing appreciation for such a brilliant panel discussion. Uh, we will continue the battle against COVID. It is important to continue. And as BP has just uh, uh, said now, preparation in between uh, before the pandemic is key uh, for having a more robust uh, uh, reaction. Moreover, government and national leaders need to take extra steps to assume accountability for health workers' safety. This means ensure that health workers have equitable access to PPE. This is also a global duty. Thank you for WHO and CDC for the work they do for that. But we need more. And the psychological burden that they are facing, we need to take that in account. Thank you for uh, Dr. Aviola to have expressed that. I want to thank again uh, our expert panelists, Dr. Edward Kelly, Dr. Fozia Uda, uh, Dr. Raji Tajuddin, and Dr. Giuseppe Raviola. Thank you all. Uh, this webinar was hosted by the Center of Executive Education, which is developing a full executive education program in patient safety and health quality. Please feel free to contact any query uh, and send requests if you're interested by those program in the link that are in the Q&A. So thank you everybody, bye. And really, we all learn a lot and we are grateful for all of, us, all of you to have been with us on this important debate. Thank you very much, bye-bye. Thank you, bye. Bye. Thank you. bye, -bye.